Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, today about putting pegs in in the setting of relative contraindications. I don't have anything to disclose. So the objectives of uh, my talk are really to first review the contraindications of peg tube insertion uh, in general. And then I'm going to go into some of the strategies and methods to sort of circumvent um, putting or putting in pegs in these sometimes difficult situations um, and sort of circumventing some of those relative contraindications. So we'll go first to go through the absolute contraindications. Um, one is to failure or inability to advance the gastroscope through the esophagus, either if they have severe trismus, that you're just, that they have a lock jaw, that you're just not able to put the gastroscope in, that would sort of preclude uh, putting a peg tube in in the first place. Um, like Dr. Tettelbaum talked about earlier, um, limited patient life expectancy, less than 30 days, um, is for me an absolute contraindication, purely because a peg tube is mostly for long-term enteral access, and if the patient's not going to survive that long, um, then we have to really have a discussion about what the goals of life or goals of care should be. Um, along the same lines, another contraindication is uh, peritonitis and he being in a, uh, in, a, in a patient that's hemodynamically unstable. So in terms of uh, my talk, we're going to go through some of the relative contraindications or what used to be considered contraindications to peg tubes, uh, one being uh, previous abdominal surgeries or any previous gastric procedures, either if that's bariatric procedures or, dis uh, or gastrectomies. Um, with patients with ascites, um, the reason for that would really be because of the amount of fluid that can be interposed between the stomach and the anterior abdominal wall, which can sometimes um, cause increased risk of complications, whether that be from wound infections, leakage, or dislodgement. And along the same line, a lot of these are actually related to complications from liver cirrhosis. So that includes coagulopathy, um, putting patients at increased risk of bleeding, uh, particularly in the stomach or in the GI tract, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, um, really because of the reasons of having a large liver and large spleen can really um, distort the anatomy and it can sometimes um, be overlying the stomach completely, not allowing a safe tract at all. Um, gastric or abdominal wall varices, which also in, um, puts them at increased risk of bleeding. Uh, morbid obesity, which we're going to go into, um, purely because of the amount of fat in between uh, the skin and the stomach. You can sometimes not be able to achieve a safe track, but I'm going to go through that as well. And then neoplastic disease of either the stomach, abdominal wall, um, due to the risk of seating. So I'm first going to go through coagulopathy. Um, for me, I really try to, as much as possible, uh, to use the same principles that I do for any surgical procedures that we do, and tre really try to ensure that the INR is less than 1.5 and platelets greater than 50, and if we need to do blood products to do so, um, I will transfuse the patient or give products, other products such as vitamin K to achieve that. Um, and that also, as much as possible, I try to hold anticoagulants um, if, if it is possible. Anything like Coumadin, Zeralto, and Plavix, according to the current recommendations, or any therapeutic anticoagulation in general. So esophageal obstruction, I know I put this as an absolute contraindication, indication, but I just wanted to go through some case, like a case that I've done in this situation. Um, sometimes you can actually circumvent that by either using a pediatric gastroscope or a nasopharyngeal scope or ultra-thin gastroscope instead, where you can actually ha they have a smaller diameter scope and you can actually pass it through the obstruction. Uh, you do have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that the channel in the nasopharyngeal scope, at least the instrument channel, is a lot smaller, so sometimes you're just not able to put the snare through it, in which case that's why we, um, in that in that scenario, I'll use the push more, um, to be more correct, it would be the introducer Russell technique instead, so you're not actually put, putting a lot of trauma or increased complications from that technique uh, past the obstruction. Um, in one circumstance, I, I've had uh, esophageal uh, obstruction. It was a benign stricture, so obviously I wouldn't be doing any dilations in malignant strictures, but in, in a short segment caustic strictures, there have been instances where I've uh, done a dilation either by bougie or balloon, which is shown in this picture, and that will, uh, you can see that you can actually achieve a, di um, a, a lumen uh, big enough that you can pass the scope through following that to place the peg. Because uh, in these patients, a lot of the reasons that you're putting in the peg is because of dysphagia or malnutrition. So these are some tips in terms of how to circumvent that. So I just wanted to illustrate um, previous abdominal surgeries. The scars can sometimes get in the way. Um, and it used to be considered a contraindication to put in a peg tube, mostly because of the adhesions or the fact that you might not be able to achieve a, a safe window. Um, the CT scan on the, on the right is actually showing a patient after a Whipple procedure. Um, the stomach is actually still a, relatively well opposed uh, to the anterior abdominal wall. So that's where pre-procedure imaging is helpful in those, those circumstances to see what you're getting into when you have these situations. Um, and you can see that maybe the stomach may 
mean, it, although our typical location is two finger breadths below the xiphoid and to the left, you, sometimes you do have to sort of adjust your location and put it more left lateral um, just so that you can achieve a safe tract. So as uh, Marita talked about earlier, that essentially is going through the safe track technique for these um, for these cases, um, and you can see that you can safely put in a peg in these scenarios. So in morbidly obese patients, the reason that um, it's more difficult or more challenging in these cases is really because uh, there's so much fat in between the skin and the stomach that you're just not able to achieve all those three things in the safe track technique method. Um, you just can't get the transillumination. You can't get the one-to-one. -one. Um, this picture is actually um, from a paper. Um, they call it the B-zone because I think they were naming it after themselves from the first, um, the first author whose name was Paticcio, but he was trying to name it after himself, that that's the area where there's less fat or less panis, so there's less fat to go through. Um, and in these scenarios, you can use a spinal needle, which is a bit longer than the introducer needle, so you can gain access into the stomach, and you can see that endoscopically. You can put the patients in um, a full reverse Trendelenburg, and that helps to bring the stomach down um, so that you can actually try, um, try to put the peg in. And in some cer um, circumstances, um, you can do a cut down through the abdominal walls. So in, the, uh, in those cases, you, you can actually make a larger incision um, down to the anterior fascia so you can get the one-to-one -one and transillumination through your incision. But I will say that in those scenarios, you, you do have to close your incisions afterwards because there are increased risk of infection. But generally in these patients, they do have an increased risk of infection, so it's something that you ha do have to talk to your patients about. So I'm just gonna go through some other scenarios um, that might make things challenging. Um, in patients with diaphragm elevation, either from um, neurologic disorders such as ALS, the stomach might be actually um, in the thoracic cavity and not below the costal margin. So those are just images that um, show that. Um, similar on the same page are patients with bowel obstruction. So this is actually one of my patients um, that you can see that their colon is massively dilated from uh, pseudo obstruction or Ogilvy's and um, in this, you can see that the, the colon is completely overlying the stomach, so there's not any safe window to put this in, at least radiologically, um, which is why we were always consulted for the peg tube. And along the same lines, um, other reasons that things can get in the way are liver or the spleen that are enlarged, and in this case, also ascites. Um, it's, you can see that the stomach uh, is not, there's no safe window to that stomach. So sometimes in these cases, pegs are just not possible at all. So I always tell my, like in, in these cases, I, there's just, you have to tell the patient that it may not be possible. This is another case, um, any abdominal wall varices. In these cases, actually, um, when, you pay, when you actually transilluminate, um, these patients are generally liver cirrhotics. They don't have a lot of um, subcutaneous fat. So sometimes with transillumination, you can see the varices a lot better to try to avoid them. Um, but it's nice to know uh, about them prior to putting any placement in. And in terms of all these scenarios, I kind of group them together in terms of what strategies you can use. Um, I really make sure that I ensure maximal insufflation of the stomach so the, gas, the stomach is fully distended. So at least it pushes all the organs down, putting them in reverse turn Dallenberg. Try to optimize um, the, the, your, um, your operating room to try to really make sure that you can uh, get a safe track to the, uh, to the stomach. Um, you can use adjuncts, which is going to be discussed later. I just put them on the slide, um, but you can use fluoroscopy, colonoscopy, um, and IR guidance. You can use, rely on your interventional radiology colleagues. So on the right, you can see that the, um, the radiologist has put in a needle, so you can actually use that as, your, uh, as a marker for you to put in the pegs. I mentioned ultrasound as there's some papers that actually illustrate that for um, abdominal wall varices or gastric varices, your radiology colleagues can actually mark them on the, on the interior abdominal wall on the skin for you so that you can try to avoid them. Um, so ultrasound is a useful adjunct for that, but I'm gonna not really go into that because there's a talk later on that. So in patients with high risk of dislodgement, um, those do include patients with hiatal hernias, dementia and agitation, as um, we talked about earlier. Patients with ascites, purely because of the amount of fluid that can accumulate, um, is particularly in poorly managed cirrhotics. The amount of acidic fluid can vary from time to time, so that puts them at higher risk of dislodgement. Um, peritoneal carcinomatosis, and then factors that contribute to poor wound healing, so that precludes um, getting a mature tract, so that includes malnutrition, uh, immunosuppression, or chemotherapy. So as outlined earlier, um, in those scenarios, I will actually, um, in addition to the PEG, I'll put three T fasteners around it. Um, that helps to oppose more stomach area over uh, to cr create a larger tract um, so that if the tube gets as larger, there's a possibility that you can replace it safely or have your radiology colleagues help to replace it safely. Um, 
and so that you can uh, decrease the risk of peritonitis. Um, and you can also put an abdominal binder on as well to prevent that. But I will say, though, um, I've had patients with severe dementia and agitation, despite all these T fasteners and abdominal binders, they ripped it out anyway. So it's not a guarantee at all. But it helps, it at least decreases that risk of dislodgement, maybe a little bit. <laughs> So I just wanted to illustrate here in patients with hiatal hernias, sometimes um, the tube can be placed a little bit more distally. You may not necessarily want to put it in the fundus. So that's where um, additional imaging or sometimes even a laparoscopic assisted might be helpful uh, to make sure that you've placed the peg in the right location. Uh, but putting it more distally sometimes reduces the risk of dislodgement so that the stomach, when it does go, if it does go back into the chest, um, it doesn't really pull the, the stomach with it if it's more distal. So in terms of any overlying devices, I'm just showing some pictures of uh, a VP shunt on the left and then a cardiac pacemaker or ICDs are on the right. Uh, sometimes these leads can sometimes not, you can't really see them on the um, outside, but with fluoroscopy or x-rays, you can actually see where the, the tracks of these um, leads are. So that can be a useful adjunct uh, to prevent any um, dislodgement or interference of those uh, devices. So it is possible to put a peg in, and I would use fluoroscopy in those instances. So in conclusion, I really just wanted to discuss some techniques um, in terms of the importance of pre-procedure imaging um, using safe track methodology. And you can actually use real-time imaging at the same time to help with the peg tube placement. But it really is possible in those in, in non-ideal and high-risk patients. It just really depends on having a good goals of care discussion, which uh, Dr. Teitelbaum talked about earlier. Um, but it is safe and it is possible. So um, I will be able to take any questions if there are any.